In this video, I want to talk about when you should trust your guides or when not to. And we want to assess one of the most crucial decisions that you're ever likely to make in the mountains. And that is to accept the risks of ascending with a chance of reaching the summit or to descend back to the safety of base camp with your life intact. And this is particularly important at altitude. And to get a better understanding of the full scope of that question and all the things that are involved, I want to share with you a story that uh, recently happened from one of my clients who was training to climb to the summit of Aconcagua, but unfortunately didn't make it. So the story is like this. I'm super excited, looking at my phone every day, waiting for a message to see if it got to the summit and I get this message. I chased, my group summited last Monday, nine out of 12 made it. I made 5,940 meters before turning around. Over that time, I had no symptoms of altitude sickness and I was feeling great. I'm back in Sydney late next week if you wanted to catch up for a debrief. And I saw that and I'm like, that sounds like perfect conditions. You were feeling great, no altitude sickness. You know, the weather's good. Other people got to the top. What went wrong? Like, I just don't understand. Tell me what happened. So now that I've had that debrief with Paul and found out exactly what happened and why he turned around, I wanted to share that with you because there's a learning opportunity in this, not just for me as a coach to see, you know, potentially what I did wrong with the training program, but also there's loads that you guys can learn from this experience so that, you know, if you're ever in this situation, you can make the right decision. So a little bit of backstory so you understand this fully. This was the first mountain for Paul. He'd never done anything like this. That's a big mountain, 6,920 meters, I think. So there is definitely some altitude problems that are going to arise. So we, when we had the debrief and uh, he gave me the full story, and like I said, he was feeling good. He was feeling very strong. But as he was approaching camp three, which is about the 6,000 meter level. He was, you know, 20 minutes from camp three and he said that he was, you know, puffing and breathing quite heavily. And he got to this point and the guide from the company told him to go down. You know, he's 20 minutes from camp three. He had to turn around and go back down to camp two. So that's another four hours of descent in double boots. And, you know, so I started to ask more questions about what the situation was. It was 1 p.m., um, so definitely no time pressure. It wasn't even summit day, and he was, other than you know breathing heavily, he had no symptoms of altitude. When he got back to camp, he saw a doctor. The doctor assessed him and said, you have you know, no symptoms of altitude sickness. You don't seem to be suffering from altitude sickness at all. So from learning that, I'm starting to ask myself the question, why did this guide think that uh, he wasn't fast enough or fit enough to actually be given a chance to go and summit the mountain on the following day? So the day after descending from camp three, Paul wakes up, he tells me he's feeling pretty much fully recovered, not feeling tired, his muscles have recovered properly, he's not feeling any soreness, not feeling the altitude really. And so that, in my mind, is the perfect condition to be able to go up to the summit, but he wasn't given the chance. And I think what's happened here is that the guide has really erred on the side of caution, but far too much. I mean, Breathing heavily when the for the first time that you arrive at 6,000 meters. I don't know if you guys have, have been through that, but it's very normal to be breathing heavily at, at 6,000 meters, especially when you first arrive and you've just done, you know, five, six, seven hours of pretty steep uphill walking with a backpack on. You're going to be breathing heavily. That is not a sign of altitude sickness. It's just a sign of being at altitude. From what I gather, the the guides on this trip, they were really about speed. And speed in high altitude mountaineering is, it's not really a factor that you should be considering until summit day. So when my client was turned around the day before summit day, that speed, it really wasn't a factor, especially given that it was 1 p.m. I've always told my clients this, and I'll continue to keep telling people this because I think it's really important. You don't need to go fast at altitude, and you, in fact, you certainly shouldn't. There's good evidence to suggest that overexerting yourself when you're at altitude is actually going to bring those symptoms on quicker. And we see this all the time when we have super fit people, you know, triathletes and such, and they go and do the trek to Everest Base Camp, 
and they try and smash it because they're these competitive athletes and they get sick from altitude because they're pushing themselves too hard. Of course, summit day is a completely different thing. When you have your summit day for big mountains, there's often a lot more altitude that you've got to ascend. So of course, yeah, now is the time that you want to exert yourself and get to the summit as quickly as possible and get back down within a safe hour. But the day before summit day, that's when you should be, you know, kind of chilling and relaxing and just taking uh, your time. So naturally I told Paul this and I said, you know, take your time, take it super easy until summit day. But what this guide has, has, has done is seen my client breathing heavily, maybe being one of the last couple to come into camp, and he's seen that as, as, a, as a weakness instead of a strength, and he's told him to go down without really taking a full assessment of uh, you know, his symptoms, without using a pulse oximeter and getting a reading on his blood oxygen saturation, without really asking my client how he felt, whether he was feeling the symptoms of altitude sickness. And I think if he'd done that, he would have realized that he wasn't suffering from altitude sickness at all. And what he should have done is gone straight into camp three, have a good rest, and then wake up fresh the next day, ready for summit day. So I guess what I'm saying is this guy f***ed up. And whilst the summit isn't everything, I think that to deny someone, it's a really crucial decision and it shouldn't be made lightly on whether to send someone down. Having said that, I understand, you know, erring on the side of caution and being safe. Obviously, we don't want to push clients into a situation where they're going to become sick. But in this situation, when the weather's good, there's plenty of time. It's 1 p.m. It's not even summit day. You're near 20 minutes from camp three. It just baffles me completely. Now you guys might watch this video and think at the end that I'm just a bitter old guy who didn't get his way and uh, is making commentary on a decision that was made on a mountain on the other side of the world. But I have a huge stake in this. I genuinely care so much about my clients and whether they succeed and whether they feel fulfilled from the trip regardless of whether they get to the summit or not. And so I have a big stake in that. I really want to see my clients succeed. And when I feel like I myself have done everything within my power uh, to, to get this person to the summit and for that to be taken away by a guide who's just seen this, seen this guy going a little slower and said, nope, you're too slow. You've got to go down. You're not going to be able to keep up the pace that I want to set as a guide. That doesn't sit right with me. And I really don't think that that's the way that people should be guiding trips. So this conversation I think is, is so important and that's why I've made already so many videos on this topic. I mean, I'll, I'll link them up here that you can check out. I've got symptoms of altitude sickness, a whole video on Diamox and the three golden rules of altitude. If you're doing a trip above, you know, 4,000 meters above sea level, I think it's super important that you go and watch those videos and get a full understanding of altitude so you can prevent a situation like this happening and hopefully under the right circumstances being fit having good weather and having no symptoms of altitude sickness hopefully i'll see you on the summit peace by the way this is my little training ground and uh i've just filmed a nice little session called heartbreak hill which is an old school one from uh, back in my brisbane days when we had a physical business training people face to face it was a really popular session so i'm adding heartbreak hill just filmed it to all of our new programs if you want to check them out there'll be a link in the description below peace